So I hope to air for the first time during the Super Bowl. And I literally like, I'm pretty sure I dropped my phone and I just started bawling. I was like, no way. Hello, 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 and welcome to episode three of Gratitude City, where we go to get good vibes, feel motivated and uplifted, and be a part of a community of people with the mission to be good, be nice, be kind, and shine a bright light on this world. My guest on this episode is a very special young lady who I met only a couple of months ago. Kaylin O'Brien is 24 years old and has been through a lot in her short life but that has not stopped her from becoming a fierce, determined, and eloquent young woman, an avid runner, and an impressive philanthropist. Caitlin, welcome to Gratitude City. Thank you very much for being here. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. I'm so excited to be on your podcast today. So excited to share my story and my journey. Um, And like you said, motivate and inspire. Um, other people. So thank you so much for having me. I, uh, it's, it's my absolute pleasure. And uh, we have a lot of we have a lot of similarities in a lot of different ways. And, and because of those shared experiences, I think that we're going to be able to have a conversation that that brings a lot of value to uh, to a lot of uh, a lot of kind of different people, um, especially um, youngsters and their and their families that are going that are going through uh, not only you know sick kids or neo kids or a hospital, but I think uh, some lessons that we talk about here today and some things that we chop up about um, can be translated to to kids and people in general that are going through generally hard times and or faced with challenges and especially in the climate that we're in today. I think that'll land really well and be able to help a lot of people. So uh, without further ado, we'll jump right into it. And uh, I start every show by asking the guests kind of to tell us a little bit about themselves uh, as a youngster. Um, And you have the distinguished privilege of being the youngest guest on the show so far. So you're not really that far removed from... uh, (laughs) from this time period that I'm going to be talking about. So um, what were you like, like, like 13 to 19, your teenage years, your high school years, what kind of, uh, what kind of things were you into? What made you tick? I, I don't know. This question is so hard for me to answer because I feel like those years are supposed to be like the highlight of your life. And like, I'm still young. I'm only 24. And everyone always talks about, Oh, the teenage years are the best. But for me, I look back on them and it's a bit of a struggle for me. I did have a lot of milestones and exciting things that happened during those times, but that's kind of really when my condition and my illness kind of set into me and that severity of it kind of became real. Um, and it's, it was hard. I like to think that I was like strong and passionate and determined and driven, but I also know I was very sensitive and I, always wanted everybody to be happy and I always wanted everyone to feel comfortable and be confident but I struggled with that myself um and I always knew in those years that I wanted to share my story and my experience but I didn't know how to do so in a way that wasn't um like searching for pity or making people feel bad for me I always wanted my story to be shared in a way that inspired people and motivated people right Um, it was during those times that I was in and out of hospital a lot. Um, I missed out on a lot of like hanging out with friends because I was always going to the hospital or going for checkups or having surgeries that it was just different than how most people envision their, their teenage years. And during that time was when I started my, um, fundraising for sick kids. So I was sharing my story a lot more than I had before. I've never been something that kind of hid my story or I was ashamed of myself or my I like I knew I was different and I wanted to share that with people I don't know I really found a love for dance and running um I was really close with my family I've always have been and I was more so enjoyed spending time with my family and hanging out with them um because they are the ones who truly understood what I had been through and they were there to support me 
and motivate me. Um, but yeah, I was just trying to navigate through a time of uncertainty because I, at that point, I had understood what my condition was, but I didn't know what it would meant for my future. Would I be able to go to university? Would I be able to find a job in the future? Would I be able to achieve things that I had set up for myself? Um, but I slowly came to realize that I had big dreams, but I was gonna make them happen, um, whatever way it took. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so you, I just want to, I just want to set some context. Uh, I want to set some context for, for the audience who's going to be, who's going to be watching this. Uh, not, not to uh, first to clarify what your journey actually has been, but also to help set the framework for the, the things that we're going to end up talking about that you alluded to about inspiring people and motivating people. I want to, I want to dive a little bit into, into your uh, condition and what that looked like so that we can, we can really clearly show people that you've been through like, You've been through it. And for a person who's been through as much as you to be able to stand on top of this mountain and preach things about accountability and, and finding happiness and be, and being in charge of our mindset and the way we look at the world, other people who are going through, doesn't have to be the same struggle, but a struggle in general, because everybody struggles differently, that there is a way to get out of this um, in a positive and productive way. So, so take it all the way back. You were born, but according to the video that you shared with me when we first met without a butthole, which, yeah. was the, which was the title of the video you sent me a month and a half ago when we first met. Um, so that tipped off, that tipped off the doctors very clearly, like there's something up here. But they didn't know right away. They spent, they spent two years, they spent two years trying to diagnose you. So what did, what did those two years look like? And tell, uh, tell the audience what you were actually diagnosed with and what that means. Yeah, for sure. So when I was born, I was born on June 27th in 1996 um, during the Gay Pride weekend. Um, <laughs> that just adds a bit more excitement to the, to the time. Um, but I remember, well, I don't remember. My parents have told me that as soon as I was born, one of the first things babies do when they're born is they poop. Um, and also the nurses take a rectal temperature. And so when there was a struggle taking the temperature and I didn't poo right away, it kind of raised some concern. Um, they quickly discovered that the passageway wasn't fully developed, wasn't fully formed. So they rushed me to sick kids and I had my first surgery and my first day of life. And that was kind of the, the starting point. Um, things kind of, the first couple of years were very complex and we weren't sure what was wrong. Um, and so there was a lot of trial and error trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Um, first it was my bum hole, then it was my digestive system. Um, a few years later, it was my bladder and my kidneys. Um, and it was just over the years, more issues started to arise. And then they kind of pieced it all together and diagnosed me with Vactual Syndrome. Um, and Vactual is an acronym. It stands for vertebrate, anus, cardiovascular, trachea, esophagus, renal, and limbs. And basically, it's like a combination of a bunch of different birth defects, um, that are somewhat intertwined with each other, and that's how they're able to kind of piece it as one and Yeah, because that seems like a really wide range. That seems like yeah. a really wide range of, of things. Yeah, so each patient with factual kind of has a different severity of each letter. So, for example, I don't um, have a heavy severity in the, in the L, which is the limbs. Some people with my condition are missing their thumbs or missing their forearms, where with me, I'm not, I don't have any limb abnormalities, but as we'll talk about Shana later is running, I have a lot of joint pain and my stature, I'm quite short for my height, um, for my age. Mm -hmm. And so it's things like that where the severity of certain letters um, varies with each patient. Some patients lack certain letters um, in, in general, like in total, um, 
where some people it's really heavy on some letters and not so heavy on the others, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, totally. That makes total sense yeah. for sure. <laughs> So for it me, just seems weird. It just seems weird to me uh, that you, the the condition Vactral syndrome is one acronym with all of these different things. Yet yeah. someone who has it can have one or two or multiple of these separate things that aren't presented at all um, yeah. externally. So that it's it seems like super odd that they wouldn't just be their own things. Yeah. Like I, well, they are, they are their own things, but often they seem to be, like, factual syndrome is really rare um, to begin with, but when they have, when a patient has multiple of this, these kind of deformities or complications, they can pair it together, because um, often these things are seen together, I guess. Um, I right. guess there's still a lot of unknowns about the whole thing. But and there might and there might be like some kind like you like you said there like there is some nuanced inner working between the bodily systems that yeah. that you know a re a person that's not in that kind of world would uh, would necessarily know about or be aware yes. of. Like you never would think that limbs and cardiovascular systems would be yeah in right the same yeah diagnosis. exactly like, exactly yeah, totally exactly. understand. For example, like the. The A, which is um, improved anus, kind of connects to the esophagus and the trachea as they are one system. You, yeah. Or the kidneys and the bladder, they are connected as well, and they connect to the blood and pumping of the blood, which is the heart, and it all is intertwined. Yeah. Uh, but it is crazy to think how it's all kind of pieced together like that. <laughs> For sure. It's crazy to think about how complex the how complex the body is. Uh, my sure. guest, my guest last week is a sports therapist, so we talked a little bit about the complexities of the body, and it is uh, it's it's absolutely insane what what the body is capable of, and 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 what the mind um, what the mind is capable of. So, t walk us through kind of walk us through what zero to eighteen looked like, like. I you I know that you've had over fifty surgeries, yeah. Um, and from what I've seen, what I'm what I've seen in the video, a lot of them have are to do with the digestive the digestive system. So, kind of talk to us about how the doctors have this little girl that doesn't have a complete uh, digestive system, can't expel waste from their body to where you are right now? Like, yeah, what, does, sure. what does that look like? So um, when I was born, obviously without the bum hole, they had to create a, um, a colostomy bag, which is a, they take a piece of your intestine and they pull it through to the outside of your abdomen and you poop into a bag. Um, I'm gonna kind of break it down by certain systems because it's easier to kind of follow along because um, everything was kind of intertwined with each other as, um, over the years. So they gave me a colostomy bag um, until I was not big enough to undergo surgery to fix the passageway to create a bump hole. And so I had a colostomy bag for, I want to say, about a year and a half, two years maybe. And then they created the passageway. And then then I had a butt hole, magically. Uh -huh. Crazy what they can do. It's Jeez, There you and, go. And then over the years... I didn't have great control over it um, and it didn't function a hundred percent. So now um, when I was six or seven, I got a cecostomy tube, um, which is just a tube that goes into my cecum, which is part of my intestines. And I flush that every night. Um, and that just kind of maintains my bowel movements. Um, so that's like my, my bowels, um, my bladder and my kidneys, there was some complications when I was really young, um, but it was mostly something they just had to wait and see how things were when I started to like get potty trained and see how I could control that. So I got something called a metrophenoff, um, which is basically a passage where they put it usually in your belly button. And it's like a little tunnel that goes into your bladder and you catheterize it. So I had that for a couple of years and then some complications arose with that. So then I had a tube that was like permanently put in my into my bladder and I had a pee bag on my leg. I was like in like elementary school and it's, I look back and it's crazy to me because I would like swing on the monkey bars and my bag would just like 
be flapping there, like just on my leg. I'd be wearing shorts. Like I didn't, I didn't care. I wasn't faced by it. Right. But now I look back and I'm like, wow, like that's crazy. Because if <laughs> I was me now, I don't know how I would deal with that. But that was that. And then they created a new passageway after a couple of years. I'm um, just giving my body some time to heal. And now I have the same thing. Um, so I like, it's a much off and off, but it's just using different insides. The first one, they use my appendix. Um, and then now they use my intestines because my appendix wasn't there anymore. But it's the same sort of thing, a passageway, um, which I catheterize every day. And that's how I go pee. And then for my digestive system, my like actual eating, when I was really, really young, I would throw up everything they tried to feed me. So I had a surgery when I was young to not be able to throw up. It's called a fundoplication. And basically, they just tie a little knot in your esophagus and like a flap to make it so I can't throw things up. But in order to do that surgery, they had to give me a feeding tube, which I had a G-tube for 16 years. And that was my main source of like nutrition. Um, It also just, when you're in the hospital, you're not really wanting to eat as like, so that was just my main source of how I got food. Often I got my medicine through there because they knew my body was able to digest it that way. Um, didn't make my intestines work as hard to try and break down the food. Right, yeah. Um, but still making sure I was getting all the nutrients I needed. So now I have my matro- my Monty, Matrofenov, which is how I pee. I have my sigostomy tube, which helps me um, with my bowels. Um, I no longer have my G-tube, which was... A bit scary to get rid of, um, but I was happy to do so when I got rid of it when I was 16. Um, and now I eat orally, but I have to watch kind of what, what I'm eating. Eat? I can't have a lot of sugar, um, yeah. a lot of fried foods. I mean, if I'm at home and I know that I have access to a washroom or I want, I know I'm going to feel a little bit sick, then sometimes I'll have a few treats. But yeah. I eat a lot of pasta and rice and bread. Um, you know what Everett Everett who had who has had stomach issues related to his heart condition and had the g-tube for for several years he uh he also really deeply loves pasta and bread like I think it's just like the simplicity of it he will literally eat pasta until he explodes like he loves it more than anything in life all the time I think it's just like a comfort food. Like I know that it's not going to make me feel sick or it's not going to cause any complications. And when I was still on, when I still had my G-tube, um, pasta was something I ate a lot in the hospital. And I think it's for me, it's just, it's like a safety food. Like I just feel like it's one of those things I know is going to be okay. Um, right. And it tastes dino and and it's delicious. Like pasta is so good. Exactly. <laughs> pasta is so good. My my dad, my dad, if someone told my dad, like, you have to eat pasta every day, he'd be like, sign yeah. me up. I'm in. Yeah. Check. Like, that's exactly. his favorite food in the whole world. I'm like, thank gosh I'm a runner. So those carbs would catch up. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's, it's like, what can I do where these carbs are a positive thing in my world? Exactly. Oh, running. There you go. I need lots of energy for that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so in th- this whole this whole crazy fifty surgeries, like if you and you had those fifty surgeries, bef- like before you were eighteen, and, yeah. and left sick kids. So if you average that out, that's like three surgeries a year. Yeah. Um, that <laughs> is that's a lot of that's a lot of time in the hospital how like from zero to 18 how how long cumulatively would you say that you lived at sick kids like you were admitted to sick kids um so I actually like was asking my parents this question because I thought it was a really interesting um thing to think about because I consider sick kids my second home I feel like I spent years and years and years there if I added it all up um and most of my surgeries were in the first like four years of my life. Um, Afterwards, it was just like roughly like one major surgery, like every few years. Um, And then just like maintenance surgeries, like getting my tube changed or um, things like that, like day surgeries. So when I asked my parents, they said roughly around three years, if we add it all up. Right. Um, 
which is still crazy to think about. But <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like in my head, I feel like it might be a bit longer. But my dad seems to think it's around three years if we add it all up. Um, well, but yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, three years cumulatively over 18 is a long time. That's, yeah. that's one sixth of your life at that point was spent at sick kids, but just not even just time alone, it's one six, but now throw in the fact that it, it is basically one of the emotional centers of your life. Like yeah. you're like, there's so many emotions wrapped up in that hospital. There's anxiety, there's, there's fear, there's relief. So even though your, your physical body was only there for three years, your, your mind and your mental state and your emotional state had spent a lot more time kind of yeah. thinking about that environment, which is why I think you, um, you've spent more time cumulatively there. I feel, I feel the same thing too. And that's, I speak from that, from, ex, from a, a place of experience. Uh, we've stayed there like Evie's three and a half. We've probably spent seven months cumulatively in the hospital, but mm-hmm. it feels, it feels longer because of how intense that time is when yeah, you're there. And we weren't even taking into account, like if I went for like a doctor's appointment and we were sitting in the waiting room for like three hours, like, we didn't even think about that. We were just thinking about the time that I was like actually admitted to the hospital or like right, the right. days we yeah, just go exactly. to the emergency. Like you never actually get admitted, but you go in, you get a referral, you figure what is going on, right? And we didn't even like think about that. We were just thinking, okay, like from my surgeries, how long was I there? Which is like, right. now that I think about it, it's probably much longer, but. Um, yeah, because just in waiting room time, you probably have another year or more just in time spent in, that, in the in the waiting room. Where is, uh, what floor were you on? Um, so mostly I was on general surgery um, and urology. So, yeah. No, no, but I just, I mean, like I, I, the only two floors that I, that I paid attention to were, um, I know that cardio is on the fourth floor and I know cancer is mm-hmm. on the eighth. I didn't really so, put a lot of... Yeah, so my unit actually used to be up on 8A and then that became the cancer unit. So then I think it's like five or six, like on the other side. Yeah, but. the... Uh, <laughs> I had experience, we had experience with two because of all of Evie's surgeries and the, and the CCCU is down on two. And yeah. then three was pretty unknown to us. Four was where Evie's long-term ward was and Ronald McDonald room. Um, mm-hmm. But five to eight or literally, I think we've only been up to eight a couple times just for a couple mm-hmm. of like one-offs. But, but it used to be where urology and general surgery are, but now I think they're down on like five. So, yeah. And then we, <laughs> and then, uh, plus when you were there, Samsung room wasn't there yet. No, there was only the Marnie's Lounge. But Marnie's even that Lounge was there, there, right? When yeah. Marnie's Lounge was there. Um, but the Samsung room, which they've put in, I don't know when they put in, but that is so sick. One thing I got to say about sick kids is like, they really do go above and beyond with respect to making the kids and the families as feel as at home as possible. Oh yeah, for sure. It's crazy. The things that they... Um, that the hospital does. I was on the Sick Kids Children's Council, um, I want to say about six years, and we were just a group of patients um, who were just trying to make the hospital a better place for kids and their families. Oh, that's cool. And so we helped, um, like, bring the meal train, which is, like, the the food services to the room. Which is unreal, by yeah. the way. I honestly I can't know. even believe the number of, the sheer number of items that are on that menu. It's like, oh, you want Subway? Oh, you want teriyaki, pizza, pizza? We got you. It's crazy. Yeah, exactly. Chicken, nu- <laughs> chicken nuggets, like stir fry, yeah. like. Yeah. So we helped create that. And we also um, were there when they did the grand opening of Money's Lounge. And it was just Wait like. Wait a second. We were- Wait a second. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. The yeah. kids council, the kids council put that meal train in place? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that just go, first of all, that's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, that's something that you and your, that you and your crew should be extremely proud of because that is a service that 
that is a service that makes a lot of kids happy because yeah. when you know you hear about the stereotypical like hospital food That's is bad <laughs> and like humans like i speaking for myself and a lot of people that i know eating food is the bringer of the joy for a lot of people so yeah. if you can at least give someone a bright spot that's just one more something little even as inconsequential as like i can get nuggets tonight is something to make kids you know give kids something to look forward to so first of all congratulations on that. that's amazing Thank second you. of all it speaks to sick kids and their dedication to really providing that kid first uh, approach because yeah. they've empowered youngsters into giving them to give them advice on how youngsters exist like what how yeah. they feel what they're looking like what they're looking for what they need right and it's it's like the perfect little case study to say hey you guys have been through the hospital what can we do to make your life and your care and the life of all the other kids better and it didn't, when I was doing it, it didn't seem like work. It was like a way that I was able to give back to the hospital and kind of yeah. use my experience to better the hospital. Not that there's much more better sick kids can get, but it was the little things like that that really do make a big impact on um, the patients and their families during their stay at the hospital, for sure. Yeah, man, for sure. I mean, you're, you're, when, when you're in the hospital, um, when you're in that hospital long term, um, there's something really serious going on and anything that they can do to just make it seem as close to some semblance of normal um, as possible is super appreciated. Um, just to kind of any little bit of comfort, any little bit of comfort is, is appreciated. So when you were, when you guys were, uh, have you lived in Stouffville your whole life? So I actually um, grew up in Toronto and Scarborough and then we moved to Stouffville when I was about um, nine. Okay. So when yeah. you were, so Toronto, you would have been too close to, to qualify for RMH. Yeah. Yeah. Even Stouffville too. So was Stouffville also, because Stouffville is like 45, 50 K. So that's kind of like right on that cutoff. Was that also oh, yeah. because it's GTA, you wouldn't um, qualify? We never really reached out to that um, resource just because I also have an older brother who was going to be at home as well. And oh, so yeah, right. I always had, um, usually my mom or dad would always stay with me at the hospital and then the other one would be at work or taking care of my brother um so yeah right so of... and then and they would take turns or was there yeah. like one or the other who was there with you more of the time like i must like was was there someone there with you every night or or would they um, or would they well, like for the early years for sure but as yeah. you got older they were like okay good night kate like see you tomorrow um, there was when I was younger, when I was like a younger teen, even I want to say up until I was like 13, there was always somebody there with me. Um, my mom would usually do the day shift. My dad would come at night and then sleep there and then he would go to work during the day and my mom would stay with me during the day. Um, but as I got older, as I got older into my older teens, I wasn't really there for long term. Um, right. It would be like max a week at a time and most yeah. of the time I would um still have somebody there or I think I've spent maybe like five nights there alone in my teenage years but when I was younger my parents were always there with me which I'm so thankful for because they're yeah, my, for my sure. number yeah. one advocate for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, and, I, and I only ask because because um Evie has never spent a, a minute in the hospital alone uh it's either Leslie or I or the combination of us yeah but what's but as as the as the kids get older, it almost might become a case of like like when I was 16, 17, 18, I didn't want to be hanging out with my parents all the time, yeah. regardless, right? So yeah, like there's that there's that transitionary period where it's like where it's yeah. like, okay, I'll do this, I'll and like and with like you with the phones and you can chat with your friends do your homework yeah. do whatever you want like yeah so that <laughs> so that's interesting it's it, this is a really cool opportunity for me because i kind of get like a little crystal ball glimpse i get a little crystal ball glimpse into evie's 
into Evie's future. I can kind yeah. of like ask you questions about things that Everett will be experiencing in like, yeah, the, like at any time from now until, until 18. he's 18. But you know what, during those times, like, yes, most teenagers don't want to be around their parents, but during those times of struggle and suffering is when we need, uh, that's when I needed my mom and dad the most and my brother. Um, I'm going to get emotional. Oh my goodness. Um, but that's when I needed their support the most. And I, I don't know what I would have done if they weren't there with me. So it's crazy. I used to think back and think, oh, I don't need them. I'm fine. I'm strong enough. But then the times came and I was like, no, like I need you here. Like that's not even an option. <laughs> so it's interesting to kind of see the difference in what life would be like as a normal teenager as opposed to a teenager in the hospital, right? Those support structures are huge. And so your mom was there with you during the day. Yeah. So did she did she kind of step away from work in order to do that? Or did she was she always like the stay-at-home mom figure? And and when you were born, that just became the new allocation of her time. Um, no, she still but when I was young, um, in the hospital, like as a baby, um, she was still working. And she's had the same job um, and her work was just really supportive and letting her take the time she needed to care for me. And my mom and dad kind of, like I said, kind of both balanced um, being a parent of a sick kid and work at the same time. I don't know how they did it. I also had, when I was born, my brother was five years old. So I can only imagine how crazy that would have been. But they, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, but they made it work. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's kind of like the similar that's kind of like the similar kind of uh, strategy slash uh, kind of um, arrangement per se that Leslie and I have is that yeah. I'm much more of like the special ops parent where I'm there at night because I can sleep anywhere. And yeah. Leslie treasures, honest to God, with her deepest heart, treasures sleep. And she's like the primary, uh, she's the lead with respect to Everett's care and communicating yeah. with the doctor. So it's much more important for her to be fully rested. So I'm the one in the hospital. If there's like to go park the car, get on the subway, like I'm more of like the... Like, the logistics of everything happening Yeah, outside. like the Navy SEAL unit. Whereas Leslie's like commander in chief, kind of like watching from the tower, making sure everything, making sure everything is, uh, making sure everything's good. Um, but, but back, but back to you. One thing that I'm, I've been curious about since Everett's been born is, is uh, the transition from adolescent care to adult care and how it feels to leave that like warm safety blanket of sick kids and go to like an adult hospital where where like just being it's completely totally honest different. just by sheer virtue of what they are like they're not a child specific hospital so the like the mindset is a little different um treating adults is different than treating kids so how did that how did that transition what did that look like or how did that feel yeah so from an early age um i had a great social worker at sick kids and she had always taught me to um when I became like more aware of what was going on and the severity of my condition, she always taught me to like be involved in my care. And if the doctors are coming into my room to make sure that they're talking to me, addressing me, obviously informing my parents as well, but making sure that they're, when they're talking about my treatment, that they're talking to me and including me um, in my plan of care, um, asking me my opinions, my thoughts, how I was feeling, and just making sure that I was always not, informed and educated on what was going on. Um, obviously, at the end of the day, my parents were the ones making the big decisions. Um, but because, you were kept abreast, like you were like a primary stakeholder yeah. in this and and and, yeah. and your doctors and, and your parents and you were a three person unit making oh, yeah. these decisions yeah. and, and that you felt respected and informed and in the loop and in kind of control of, of your, of like the course of your, of your treatment. Yeah. It, I remember when I was 16, I was having a surgery done for um, some bladder problems and I actually got to sign my like 
um, consent. my surgery, my surgery paperwork. Um, like there's no age of consent for signing that sort of stuff, but it was like a kind of a, a mo big moment for me. Cause I was like, okay, like I need to start being in control of my healthcare because once I leave the hospital, once I leave sick kids, it's on me. Like, You're right. I had my first um, mini small procedure outside of sick kids and like, they didn't let my mom come in with me. And I was like, sorry, like, what? I have to go by myself. Like, I'm not ready for that. I mean, I sucked it up and I did it, but it was totally different. But <laughs> even just like, I think the big difference between sick kids and the adult care is the communication. At sick kids, you have your team. Like, as we were talking about earlier, my condition is kind of has lots lots of moving parts lots of issues with different parts of my so that sick kids was a team all the staff yeah all the staff communicated they were all on the same page when the adult world i'm at seen at like four different hospitals and i know for sure that those doctors are not talking to each other so i need to be the one saying okay well this is what's going on with this part of me how is that going to affect this so how am i going to make it work um and I really need to be educated on what's going on. And I really need to speak up for myself when things don't kind of seem right. Um, but my social worker, she sadly, she passed away last year, but she had a tremendous impact on teaching me to advocate for myself and being informed and educated. Um, and she took that time to make sure that I was ready before I transitioned from sick kids. But it is a, a crazy world in the adult adult care system it's just the 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 care I wouldn't say that the care is different it's just they don't know how to um deal with situations as complex as mine I go in to the walk-in clinic for a cold obviously before COVID but I'd go in for a cold and they would be like they'd ask me to lift up my shirt to like check check my my heart rate or something and they'd be like oh what's that scar from and then it's this long-winded Oh, like yeah, 52 yeah. surgeries later, how am I going to, I'm like, no, 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 like, don't worry about that. Like, I'm just here for my cold. And it's like, I can't even begin to explain what's wrong with me. Because then they right. tell me to just go to emergency because they don't know how to, how to deal with that. Right. And I go to yeah. the emergency and they still are like, Googling what Vactual is or how they can treat me. Um, even just a few, um, at the beginning of the year, I had issues with my foot. And they were like, okay, like, is this any way connected to factual or like with these medications? Like, are you allowed to take that with your digestive system? And like, it's great that they're trying to make connections, but they have no clue. And it's, it's really complicated. And I think just like um, living with a complex condition, you really just have to be educated and knowledgeable um, about your history and your experiences in order to kind of help the nurses and work with the nurses and the doctors yeah. to kind of figure out the solution now where before the doctors were the ones figuring it all out um yeah when i was at second so it is a big a big difference but i think i've kind of learned ways to navigate it and figure out what i need um to do for myself in order to get the care that i am required now so luckily and i haven't had any major surgeries since I left sick, it's knock on wood, but hoping everything's kind of good for the next few, few years, hopefully. <laughs> nice. So what does, what does, uh, like, is there a cure for Vactral syndrome? Like what does, what, are you like in just a holding pattern? Are you like, what does the next five, 10, 15 years, is there any technology in the pipeline that, that has, you know, some promise? Uh, like what's the five, 10, 15 year outlook for, for you yeah. and, other, and other people with Bacteril? So when I was born, my parents had no clue anything was wrong with me. Um, before I was born, it wasn't until, like I said, the doctors went to go take my, rectal temperature um nowadays patients are getting diagnosed um like while they're still in the room like it's crazy the technology advances that have happened in the last 24 years um I think it's insane that they're able to be like okay this this fetus has issues with the bladder and they have a hole in the heart and they have um the limbs look a bit deformed and that they're able to kind of piece all that together now and, and diagnose them before they're 
go on um, and set that care plan um, and care team so that when the baby is born, it, it has everything already right. set up. And sorry, um, sorry to cut sorry to cut you off, but yeah. but you can feel really good knowing that you and people like you who are your age that went through it, you very likely participated in some kind of studies or right yeah. where information from your care was all gathered up and and made people be able to warn people that these are the things you look for for this yes. and and that's why I think that it's super important uh like we allowed Evie, we allowed them to use Evie in all of the studies they wanted to because if Everett's going through this like and he might as well he might as well be helping the next guys the next guys and gals who are born with Epstein's maybe be able to have you know a better shot or be yeah. able to they might discover something that makes things something easier so um yeah. so sure. all those advancements that you're just talking about are are made possible by you and other people who are allowing themselves to be subjects of studies to provide information to help the next cohort of, of, yeah. of kids. It's kind of crazy to think about it like that, but so with Vactual, there is no cure. Um, it's not like a simple, um, not even if it was like a, like there's no possibility of there being a cure in the future. It's not like they're searching for a cure. Um, it's more so just um, interventions on way that is, ways that they can fix the, um, the birth defects to allow us people with factual to live a close a to normal life, life yeah. um, and have a good quality of life. Um, so they're not even because, searching for a cure. They're not even searching no, for No, because a there's, there's not really, there's, each, like I said before, each person's situation is different, is different. and it's more of, um, more of like a, a situational thing. Like, okay, you have a problem with your bladder or you have a problem with your bowels. How can we fix that yeah. to make it easier for you? Um, or how can we fix that so that you don't get more sick? Um, there's no really give you this magic pill or do this while you're still being developed. Like, it's more so just like, how can we improve the quality of life? How can we provide resources or surgeries that are going to fix these complications as they arise? Um, and obviously with technology, like to think back when I was, when I was born 24 years ago, the fact that they were able to create a passageway to allow me to use them, use yeah. my bowels, like that's just mind blowing. And now to think like 24 years later, how, like, how are those surgeries different? Which I, maybe that's something I'll look into in the next few days. Like the surgery that I had, how is it different than the surgery kids are having today? Night and um, day, probably. Night and day, yeah. probably. <laughs> um, but it, it seems to still be the same sort of, um, treatment um maybe with a bit more technological advances but i'm actually friends with somebody who lives in california and she had messaged me on instagram because i share my story on social media and she had found me through the hashtag factual and she was her son was diagnosed um, while she was still pregnant and so i've been a part of his journey and um, he's now five years old and he was going through some of the same surgeries that I had. He got a colostomy bag, then they created a, um, a passageway for his stool. Then he got his colostomy bag and moved in. I'm like, I had been through that same situation. So there's not really um, advances in what they do to treat kids with actual, maybe just like um, before, maybe I had like a huge scar for it and now they can do things laparoscopically, um, right. things like that. So. There's no way really cure for um, voucher. It's more so just um, advances in the treatment that can be provided to make the quality of life um, better for patients. So, yeah. And <laughs> so how do me, and how sorry. do you and and how do you feel about that? Like what? Like you clearly, you clearly have, you clearly have come to terms with this and not only have come to terms with, but you have made a very conscious and active choice to use this as, as a motivational tool for yourself and also a motivational tool for others, because you're like a, you're like a powerhouse, like a little, like a beacon of, like a beacon of vibrancy 
right? And and when and I said at the top of the show, when people see that a, a, a young a young person who has been through that much, who has every excuse in the book to not be happy and enthusiastic and to still be it it really minimizes other people's you know it really makes you think hard about what you're complaining about or what you're using as an excuse and that hasn't slowed you and it hasn't slowed you down everything that you've done hasn't slowed you down and another thing that you and I share is a love of running yeah. <laughs> like I, I see on your social that that you've that you've run like a bunch of marathons um, and that like correct me if I'm wrong, but one month you ran a 5K, 10K, half marathon and full marathon in the same month. Yeah. So um, I was signed up to do the Scotiabank marathon this year for my second year in a row. And because of COVID, they canceled it, but they gave us this opportunity to do all four races, which normally are all on the same day. They all happen at the same time. So it's never been like a possibility to receive all four medals. And it was just something in me was like, I got to do it. Like, this is a one-time opportunity. Like I got to find a positive in this COVID situation. I'm like, I'm going to do it. I'm like, it's going to be hard. It's going to be crazy. People are going to think I'm nuts. But I was like, I got to do it. Like for myself, it was just... Um, Running has always been a way of um, like releasing the energy and just um, doing something that I I enjoy. The doctors when I was younger used to say that I may not be able to walk. And this is not my way of like proving to them that they were wrong. But kind of just showing that like just because somebody says you can't do something or that you may not be able to do it, to try anyways and see what you can accomplish. Um, but I've been running since I was young. My whole family is a group of runners. Um, and I don't know, I just, I, I love it. I think it's just a way to enjoy the outdoors and, um, stay healthy and active. Um, and for me, it's always been like just a time of like reflection and, um, I, when I was younger, they didn't allow me to play really, um, a lot of contact sports. I mean, I played soccer for a bit um, until I kind of had some damage <laughs> when, when I got hit with the soccer ball, but kind of learned my lesson, I guess. Um, so yeah, exactly. Just like when someone, just like when they said you might not walk, it's like, yeah, right. I'm going to start running. And when they say don't play soccer, it's like, yeah, right, buddy. Yeah. Like I want to play I'll soccer. Do it I learned my lesson. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, I, I played it when I was like five um, and then health problems arose and I stopped, but I started playing again a few years ago. Now that I'm more like aware of the consequences that could happen. Um, So I really do enjoy playing soccer and I danced for about 16 years as well. Um, But running is just something that you can do on your own time. You can do it with your family. Um, There's races which make it feel like a competition without like it's, it's more of a mental competition than comp- like yeah. there's thousands and thousands you. of people running you. these marathons. Like I'm not running to win. I'm just running to kind of achieve something that I once thought was insane. Um, but yeah, I've got a few runs planned for this year. Hopefully COVID doesn't stick around. Um, and Are you running the water? Are you running the waterfront this year? Yeah, so um, because I was signed up for it this year, they moved my registration to next year, uh, 2021. So hopefully, hopefully it still happens. Um, I've always wanted, since I started running, I've wanted to run the Scotiabank. Um, it's such a nice course. It's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I, I love running because um, I, really I really picked up my running down in when we were living down in Toronto. Yeah. Um, I started running about five years ago, but I, I got really into it for a bit and then I faded for like a year and I went from like 170 pounds to like a hundred and not when we, when Evie was born, I was like 195 pounds. And then I used running and 
uh, obstacle course racing. There was a, there was an obstacle course facility called pursuit OCR on Dufferin. Um, and I used that as my kind of escapism from what, like that really heavy life that we were, that we were submerged in. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I really fell in love with running because not only what it was doing, I left sick kids four months later, uh, when we, when we were discharged, I left at 163 pounds from 195 in three months. So not only did I enjoy what it was physically, it was more so what it provided to me mentally and emotionally that, that I fell in love with and forever and eternity, that corridor from, let's say young to Bathurst from college down to the lake was like, was like my little world. Right. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Sorry. And one, and one thing I loved about one thing I love about running in Toronto, two things. One is I'm, I'm somewhat of a showman. So I like that there's a lot of eyeballs on me when I'm like jumping over benches or like whatever, (laughs) doing my thing. But it's also not only are there eyes on me and lots of them at the same time, I'm completely anonymous to these people. So there's like, you get the thrill of having all eyes on you, but also at the same time, there's, there's no eyes on you because there's like hundreds of thousands of people around and you're just, and you're just anonymous. Exactly. It's so crazy doing any runs in Toronto when everything is just shut down for the runs and it's just, just you and a bunch of thousands of people running on the roads of Toronto um, every single time. So I've done Scotiabank um, once for the, the full marathon, but I've done a half marathon, I want to say four times, four years before last year. Like I've done the half marathon four times. Wow. And every time the beginning of the run goes right by sick kids. And it's like, not even a kilometer into the half marathon, what well, the marathon as well, but not even a kilometer into the run. And every single time I did that race, I would run past tickets and I would just bawl my eyes out. And I, it was just something about it that like, when you're running past the hospital that saved your life and you're like, the care I received at the hospital has allowed me to do what I'm doing right now. Like, it's crazy. And I, I'm getting teary eyed now just talking about it, but every single time I do that race, I'm bawling in the first kilometer because I'm in, in awe of how lucky we are to have sick kids um, so close to home and be able to get that care um, that we need, right? Like, yeah, so close to us. So, yeah. I, you know what? I, I, I very, very deeply relate to the feeling that you just described. And like, I started getting emotional when you were talking about seeing sick kids and that feeling that you feel, because when I'm running or when I'm running they're like there, it physically feels like I'm cheating because, because these bravery beads that I have on my chest Whenever I, whenever I feel tired or I feel like I'm hitting the wall, right? I literally, I physically tap these beads and I think about how much harder Everett has had to fight. And I think about how much more pain he's been in than what I'm feeling right there. And it literally feels like there's wind that comes from behind me, right? And pushes me like, like I am not able to quit. My body's physically unable to quit because how can I quit whenever it doesn't or has fought so much harder, right? So, and I, and like, that's why I bring that up because when you talk about running past that hospital, I can guaranteed bet that your pace quickens a little bit when your heart starts pumping and you're like, like, I at one time was told that I wouldn't walk and now I'm running by this hospital that that yeah. gave me the opportunity to do this yeah exactly it's pretty crazy <laughs> and and so not only running but do you look back on 
on all of the struggles you've overcome and all of the ways that you've had to, you know, protect yourself emotionally and you've had to dig deep to get through lots of tough and dark times. Like, do you look back on those experiences when you're facing tough times and like draw that, draw that kind of inspiration, motivation from your past experiences? Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I know, especially when I, um, uh, well, by the way, I love your tattoo, and I think that is an amazing idea um, with the bravery beads. Um, ever since I was like 12, I wanted to get the word believe tattooed on me. Um, that used to be the slogan at Sick Kids back, way back in the day. Um, and I was always, my parents always said like, oh, believe in yourself. Like, you're going to be okay. You're going to get through this. Um, and so I've always wanted to get that tattoo. I haven't gotten around to it yet, but one day I will. Um, but all my running shoes, I wish I had them here to show you. I have um, beads that look similar to the bravery beads and I have them on my running shoes. So every time I kind of like I'm running and I feel like I'm like getting weaker and it's getting harder, I like look down at my shoes um, as I hit the pavement and I see the beads on my shoes that says believe. Um, and that's something that's always motivated me when I'm running. But in life in general, I feel like I often not try to ignore what I've been through, but I try to um, see the positive in it and how it's given me the opportunity to be where I am right now. And I do use it as a way to motivate me, but I try not to look back on the struggles I've overcome, but more so just like where I'm at now and how can what I'm doing in this day um, or how can me getting myself through this hard time, how's that going to benefit my future? Right. Um, and how can I, how can I be strong in the moment so that I can make a bigger difference in the future? How can I um, be strong in the moment to get through this challenge so that I can achieve my dreams and my goals? Um, well, I've, my goal is to be become a nurse at Sick Kids one day. Um, and I've been in school for the past like six years trying to achieve that just because um, I was in the hospital a lot in my high school years. So I kind of struggled in high school. Um, yeah. So I've kind of been taking a, a roundabout way to get into nursing as it's a very um, uh, competitive field. Especially so at I, Sick Kids, like if you're a yeah. nurse, you want to be in the ICU at Sick Kids. Like that's like yeah. top cheese. So I've been I I use my whole experience to kind of motivate me to do, um to get through hard times, but also to I really use the future and how I can how I can use my experience in the future to better other people's lives or better my own lives to achieve goals that I want to achieve for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's, and it's like, it's not, I think I may have phrased that wrong and that it's not as much, it's not, it's not as much like thinking about the past as much as it is having the confidence to know that you're capable of of going through this crazy stuff and making it and making it yeah. out the other side. So I look at I when I look at Evie and I look into Evie's crystal ball, even though he won't like these last three and a half years have been a wild ride, right? Four open heart mm -hmm. surgeries, eight months in the hospital, like this, that, the other thing, everything you can possibly imagine has been chaos, but he'll never remember it. He'll never, he, he's not even four. He'll never remember it. Yeah. But I look at the future and I look at it as that confidence piece of when Everett comes to me and says, dad, I got cut from the soccer team. Like I tried really hard and I really had my mindset on it. I can, I can be like, son, that's the worst feeling I've been through it. It sucks. I'm here for you in any way you need, but you got this. Like, yeah. You, you sure. don't, like, trust your dad when he tells you, like yeah. you can handle, you can handle this. So grieve momentarily, but just know that, that, you know, yeah. compared to speaking, this is like a blip on the radar. Right. So, and yeah. that's, that's what kind of what I mean is, and I think that's something that kids that kids and people in general but in our context in our conversation kids that go through um these these complex situations and these troubling times they do kind of have the ability to 
they they just have to naturally develop a perseverance and a grit yeah. right that serves them that serves them that serves them moving forward and yeah. allows them to you know be more problem solve creative y just know there's just a general confidence boost that comes along with putting troubles in the rearview mirror successfully and, and, and moving on. Yeah, I for sure think that I do sometimes when I'm faced with a challenge, I'm like, this is something so simple or so small. Like I can get this through this no problem because if I've looked at what I've been through before, like this, I, I don't want to compare myself to other people's struggles. Obviously everyone has their own difficulties right. and challenges, but when I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm scared to get a COVID test but like I've had 52 <laughs> surgeries, like there shouldn't be a comparison for me. I had to get a COVID test um, weekly for work. And I was worried about it at first because it obviously goes in your nose and I've had so many NG tubes and bad experiences with that, that right. mentally I just couldn't get yeah. over the fact that something was going up my nose. And it seems so odd and so minor because I'm like, it's a COVID test, like I've had an NG tube, but at the same time it was like, it was bringing back those memories. And I think that's kind of sometimes when I try to reflect on old things, it's like, it's hard for me to like compare them even with myself because in the moment it's just different. Um, and yeah, <laughs> I do, I do kind of think to myself like, okay, I've been through a lot of harder things than what I'm going through right now. Like I can, I can get through this, but then certain things kind of trigger um memories that i i try not to remember about <laughs> right because you don't remember anything ahead of 12 years old right yeah i only remember things um before i was 12 with like if people show me photographs or like what my family right. has told me um and i think it's just like the mind has a crazy way of trying to forget about all these negative things and just try to protect you from yeah. um, having to think about those things and go through them. A lot of it, I think, was due to medication that I was on. Um, mm -hmm. And just um, now that I'm 24, like, that's almost like half my life ago, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think it's just a, like the body's way of protecting us um, and kind of trying to um, keep us strong and I know in the back of my head that like I've been through some hard times and when I sit down with my parents and we talk about these things it it's a very emotional like I'm gonna get emotional again just thinking about um the things I've been through because it was a lot and it still is a lot um but we we say in my house that like that's what's made me stronger and my my story and my journey is what has brought me to be who I am today. And my parents have always been such like a big support system for me. And they have always not treated me any different. And they've always, if I wanna go swing on the monkey bars with my pee bag hanging out, they would, they don't care. They let me do it obviously to an extent of, of things, but they have never kind of treated me differently um, because of my condition or put me in this bubble to keep me safe. Um, obviously there's boundaries and those limits of what I could do, but they always pushed me to do things that we didn't think was maybe possible, but right. like, why not give it a try? Right. Um, so yeah. <laughs> and, and that, and that is a great, that's a great point. And something that I talked with my first guest about, he has, uh, he has cerebral palsy and, um, the commonality between the three of us is that we have parents that that didn't that like I I'm going to use the word you know that pushed us to um, that pushed us to feel comfortable in uncomfortable situations that that didn't coddle because I like the parental instinct, the parental instinct is to coddle, right? Well, no, let me rephrase the parental okay. instinct. The parental instinct is to protect. We're very instinctual creatures as humans and our parental instinct is protect our babies with our whole, our whole strength, our whole being, right? 
And when you're when our babies are going <laughs> through these these crazy times and these challenging situations, sometimes what that instinct translates into is is coddling. But coddling can sometimes be detrimental because you know it could it could make the it could make the the child feel victimized or it can make them feel different what you don't want it kind or... of sets like limits and boundaries of what in our head like if I had grown up thinking like okay I'm not going to be able to walk I'm not going to be able to play soccer I'm not going to be able to go have sleepovers it would have been a like, self-fulfilling prophecy and you wouldn't have done any of those things yeah and now here I am <laughs> So how did your parents, how did your parents balance that then? Because like, I know that when Evie's in the hospital, I also find myself guilty of being a little soft because like, it's like, like they're in the hospital, right? It's like, you're like, how did your parents, how did your parents (laughs) balance that? Make balance, making sure that you felt safe and secure and had everything that you needed emotionally, but at the same time, making sure that you were also uh, developing independence and, and the ability to, you know, not see yourself as a victim or kind of not see yourself, not see the world as being against you per se. Um, for me, my parents have always, um, have always just like, let me do what what I not what I want but if I wanted to do something I would do it with the guidance to ensure safety or if something went wrong then they were there to help me for me I think the biggest thing is with my condition like I I know I'm different than other people I know I have challenges and I know I have limitations um I like to push those sometimes but for me it's like I don't know any other way of living because I've had my condition my whole life everything has kind of I've grown to accept it and grown to know what I can and cannot do. And so obviously I'm not going to think of some crazy thing that I know would put myself at risk. But if there's something I want to do, I would do it with the supervision of my parents um, on a safe environment. Um, My parents used to go with me anywhere. I would say, oh, I want to go do this. Okay, they're coming with me. Um, And due to have it, like, because I have such a complex um, medical condition, I spent a lot of time at doctor's appointments, at at the hospital, or at home during my medical care. And so I kind of missed out on a lot lot of opportunities of activities activities kids do, Mm -hmm. um, or even young adults do. Um, And so we learned once the hard way. Uh, My parents let me go to my friend's house, and we were playing in her pool, and I had gone down the slide and I, my friends were always aware of my condition. So they always kind of n- knew what to do to an extent. Um, but I was going down the slide and I had like landed in the water with like the pool noodle and I had pushed my G-tube out. And my G-tube was just like, sit, like had sunk to the bottom of the pool of my friend's house. <laughs> like... <laughs> Um, and my friend, I've always had such a great support system of friends. And so my friend, like, Did that hurt? Was that excruciatingly painful? No, I used to change my tube at home. Like, I would do it myself. So, like, it wasn't, in the moment, it wasn't that scary or bad. But I was kind of like, oh, my gosh, my parents trusted me to go to my friend's house by myself. And now my tube's falling out. Um, but my friend, like, jumped in, dove down to the bottom, grabbed my tube, and we called my dad and... He, he came over with a new one and we put a new one in. Um, but it was like... And he was probably like, are you okay? Like, like don't worry. Do, I'm yeah. not, and you're probably like, dad, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Be like, do you think I but, care? But, like, are you good? Yeah. Okay, great. That's was, all, that's all crazy, that matters. It was kind of crazy, but it was kind of... At that time, we realized that, okay, I can... I know what to do in these situations. I know what's important and how to, like deal with these situations when things arise. I also had a great opportunity of going to um, to summer camp in Alberta with kids with similar, not with virtual, but with um, ostomies. So like the way I, I use the washrooms, um, mm-hmm. the, my tube and my, my passageway to empty my bladder, those are called um, ostomies. And so I went to ostomy camp 
Um, and that's where I learned a lot of independence and um, right. how to take care of myself. And at the camp, all the staff are like medically trained and they know what to do. Um, there's always like a doctor on site. And so I think there's really where I grew in my independence um, and learning how to care for myself. Um, and now I still look to my mom to help me book doctor's appointments, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty good with dealing things, dealing with um, my, my day-to-day um, medical care. I'm 100% independent with that. Um, obviously like day surgeries and things like that. I need my, my parents support. Yeah. Obviously I don't think that'll ever change. No, <laughs> Just won't. because they have been there with me through right. everything. They know how to cope. They know how to, how to deal with things when, when things get a little out of hand. But um, my parents have always kind of pushed me to do what I think I can do. But I, um, I tell them I want to run a marathon and they say, okay, train hard. Good luck. <laughs> um, and they don't stop me because they know that um, mentally I'm strong enough and physically we'll find out if I'm strong enough. And I, I've completed two marathons now, um, I think about seven half marathons. So they've never been one to, to stop me from kind of doing crazy things or trying to live limits. a normal life. Yeah, they always encourage me to push my limits because they never wanted me to live in this in this bubble or be concerned about not being able to do something or, um, because of my condition. So they've been so supportive in every single way, for sure. <laughs> That's amazing. And they, they obviously did, they obviously did a great job, uh, because you've turned out amazing. Um, so, uh, Kate's mom and dad, kudos to you and your, and your parenting skills and all of the, all of the sacrifices, um, all the sacrifices that you made and the, the things that you had to do to make work and, and the brother and everything, um, make all that work to make sure that this, that this young lady turned out as amazing as she did. And while we're on parents, I want to take this opportunity to thank my parents as well, mom and dad, um, because as the parents of a sick kid, i.e. me, you uh, you did the same for me and, and are a real major reason of, of how I became the man I am today. So mom and dad, thank you. I love you guys. And you kind of gave me a, sh- a shining example on how I can be that for, for Everett as well. You have um, this, this good, this amazing person that you are has, has trans and, and this journey that you've been on has kind of created this, has kind of, all created this ball of awesomeness that is Caitlin O'Brien and that laser beam of awesomeness is is deployed now that you are is deployed now that you're older um, towards raising money for sick kids and a ton of it you've raised we'll talk about how much you've raised but uh, and it's only natural that when an organization has an impact on you as profound as sick kids has on you um, that you want to kind of pick up that fight Um, how old were you when you started raising money for sick kids Uh, tell us a little bit about that fund that you have at the foundation and what kind of fundraisers uh, you've put on or been a part of to, uh, to raise money? Yeah, so it goes back to when I was really, really young. Um, I found a photo the other day and I think it was like 2002 and I had a little lemonade stand set up. Um, so I had always wanted to give back to the hospital um, because I knew from a young age that that was my second home and that they saved my life there. So I always, I always knew if, if there was somewhere I could support. It was always going to be sick kids and it always will be sick kids. And so I was the champion child for sick kids, which is basically they pick a patient, um, one patient a year to, to represent sick kids. And you go um, to Florida and you meet with a bunch of different patients from different hospitals and connect and share your story and your journey. And that was kind of where I started my work with the foundation um, as a patient ambassador. And so I would go to different events and I would share my story um, for fundraisers that were supported through the foundation. And then my 12th birthday, I had a major surgery and I was in the hospital 
and people were bringing me gifts and flowers, which are obviously very thoughtful, very kind, very nice. But I said, I don't want any gifts. I want people to donate money to sick kids. And so I started at the 12, Caitlin O'Brien. At 12, you said that. Yeah, I was 12 years old when I started the Caitlin O'Brien Fund. Today, we have raised over $80,000 for the, um, the hospital, which is crazy. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and so I was doing small little fundraisers here and there, um, garage sales, bake sales, things like that. Um, some fun fundraisers that were organized by the hospital. And then I started um, an event called A Walk in the Six for Sick Kids, which we do annually. This year will be year six, I believe. So that's a big one. Um, basically, we When is it? In. When is it? It'll be in August. We haven't picked a date yet. Um, we're still kind of, I'll let you know. Um, last year, we did a virtual event um, because of COVID. So we're, right now, we're kind of on the fence on if we right. think we can go virtual or if we'll have to. Um, if we can plan an actual event this year. But that event has been like the main source of our, the donations that the kids, um, that the Caitlin O'Brien Fund has received is from that event. And so, yeah, I've always wanted to, to get back to the hospital. And I think this is the, the, for me, the best way that I can kind of say thank you to everything, um, to everyone at the hospital and the staff and um, use that money. I have my funds directed to the, and I see you in the urology and general surgery um, departments at the hospital, which is where I was mostly treated. Treated, right. Um, I get it. Yeah. So it helps those units as well as the research involved in um, conditions for um, mm -hmm. patients in those units. Um, so, yeah, right now we have raised over $80,000, which is crazy insane. Um, and I recently, um, and last month, I filmed a commercial for Sick Kids. Four of us were chosen as patient alumni um, to share our story, to help, um, to push for people to become monthly donors to the hospital. Right now, the hospital needs as much support as it can get. They were in the, the beginning capital stages. Campaign. Yeah. Yeah. They were in the beginning stages of building a new part of the hospital and then COVID mm -hmm. hit and Obviously, resources have had to been allocated, but um, yeah. So I'm part of a new, the newest campaign for sick kids called "Because Someone Gave," um, and like I said, it's for, to promote monthly donors. And it aired during Super Bowl, which was so insane. Um, it was crazy. <laughs> but, like how? Like how does that even like? Like, did you know? Did you know when they were like? Kate, we would love for you. We're doing this campaign uh, to 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 invigorate monthly donors. It's called why. It's called because of someone gave, um, and you were like, sure. You're you're just based on the nature your nature. You're like, yeah, I, I want to help. How can I help? Were you aware at that moment that it was going to be a Super Bowl spot? Or, no, so it's or actually, was that or were they like you know what this campaign's going really well we're gonna air this during the Super Bowl to try and to try and really blast this message out there. So the first time it aired was during Super Bowl, and I I didn't know before filming even the filming day I still had no idea I knew it was for social media, um like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Snapchat like I knew it was for all of that. Um, and about a week after filming, I get an email from, um, the lady at Sick Kids who had put it all together. And she was like, so what do you think about a TV spot? And I was like, okay, awesome. Sure. I'm in like, any way I can extend my story. I'm so grateful for like, awesome. Sure. And then a few days later, it was like, so we're hoping to air for the first time during Super Bowl. And I literally like, I'm pretty sure I dropped my phone and I just started bawling. I was like, no way, like this is insane. Um, and even just like, oh, when it aired and I was watching on the TV, I was like, holy, like this is crazy. I was like trying to film it on my phone and my hand was like shaking. And like, I was there was crying. like millions of people watching it, not even like yeah. at that one moment, millions of unique people watching, yeah. watching that Yeah, it was spot. so crazy. And after that, my phone was like blowing up everyone was like, because I hadn't told anybody about the campaign because I wasn't 
Um, I wasn't really supposed to be sharing anything about it until it was released. Didn't know it was going to be released on Super Bowl. Um, <laughs> like, I can just, you can't even imagine what your phone would have been looking like. Like, just like yeah, that. It was crazy. Um, it was definitely, like, such a surreal moment. And I was like, wow, like, they really value my my journey and my story and using that to help make a difference. And that's always been my number one goal is how can I use my experience and my story and my journey to benefit kids at the hospital now or in the future? Um, how can I give back to the place that saved my life, the place I called my second home for 18 years? And yeah, when that, that aired, it was just insane. Um, it was so crazy. And the clip that they aired during Super Bowl was about um, my social worker at Sick Kids who, who passed away. And so it was like a whole big mix of emotions because she was the one that had taught me how to advocate for myself, had been there through all my struggles, had supported me and my family during the toughest times. And it was like, this is a way to honor her, make a difference oh. in the hospital, spread awareness. Like, it was just insane. Um, there's also a clip on YouTube um, a different clip than the one on social media right now, but it's about my journey as well at Sick Kids. Um, part of the same campaign, it's just they had a few different um, clips running. And it's just such an amazing experience. And I've been getting messages the past few days. Um, of the, they've been airing it on different stations as well now um, up until the end of March. And so people are just randomly texting me, hey, I just saw you on the news. Or, hey, I just saw you on Hockey Night in Canada or whatever that station's called. Like, it's insane that people are still, um, I share my story openly all over social media. So it's not a shock to people that, that I'm, I'm doing it, but it's like, wow, like I know her and she's doing big things. And that's something I've always kind of dreamed about was to, to be able to make a difference that large. Um, it was insane. It was so cool. I'm so, so grateful for that opportunity, but yeah. <laughs> And you are like, you truly are by sharing your story and, and, and being open. And it's not, it's not easy for some people to share their story, but for you to do that um, and put yourself out there to help others. Uh, it really speaks. It really speaks to just generally the good nature of the, your good nature and, and just, and the fact that you are grateful for that opportunity is amazing and at your age it really it's it's very impressive you're you're one heck of an ambassador for sick kids and for the foundation and uh a, a glowing example of kids like evie who maybe one day will become an ambassador to help make uh a little bit of a difference in the lives of kids um going through tough times not even just and not even going through tough times of the hospital I mean going through t this can be extrapolated out in into anything yeah for sure um what is your secret what what's the secret sauce like with all the hardships you face with all the craziness and chaos how do you remain positive optimistic vibrant and continue to shine a bright light on the world I think for me, I've always been one to know that everyone is facing their own challenges and struggles in life. And as hard as it may be to kind of move past that, the only way you're going to achieve goals and, and motivate others and inspire others and make a difference is to kind of not ignore the past, but to use the past to push you forward to do better in the future. Um, as we talked about earlier, I... I really do look at the future and how I can make things better for patients in the future, whether that be through fundraising, through um, sharing my journey, or through educating, getting an education, and going back to work at Sick Kids. It's for me. It's really big on how can I, how can I make a difference? And and yes, I've been through hard times, but how can I use that to do good? And how can I like motivate others to to try to see the good in life and, and really focus on the good so that you can be a better person for yourself, for others. Um, and really just, I think that's just kind of been how my parents have always 
trained me to be and kind of put that mentality in my head, like believe in yourself, know that you can get through hard times. And when it gets really difficult, just keep pushing because there's, there's no, no giving up. There's no good in giving up. Um, and yeah, I think that's just kind of been my, my mentality always is just um, doing good in the world and being kind to others and accepting others' um, stories and journeys and working together with others to, to make a difference and to, to do good. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and I, I really truly have a belief um, and I've been quite loud on this over the last couple of years and you prescribe to the exact same notion when you talk about if I'm going through these hardships, how can I help someone else? Right. And one thing that I've, that has become a core principle that guides my life is when you're faced with difficult situations, we have a choice. We can use it as an excuse um, cower in fear and hide and, and break down, or we can use it as an opportunity to grow, to learn, to self-reflect, to develop, and maybe even come out better on the other side. One constant remains for both of these paths is that this uncomfortable, this painful, this negative situation exists. And there's no changing it. I, as much as I want to complain, Everett's heart condition is never going away. As much as you want to complain, bacterial syndrome is going to be a part of your life for forever. So with that inevitability being an actual part of this equation, why not extract as much value as possible out of it? That way, at least there's a positive or a couple of positives that come out of something that is never going to change. And when you say... I've gone through this. How can I help the next person behind me? It just speaks volumes to that. And as a 24 year old kid, honestly, I look at you and I'm like, I hope Everett is, is this. I hope Everett <laughs> uses this as an example of, of how to take something bad and turn it to some good. This, this, like this Caitlin girl, she went through sick kids and she's doing this and she's raising money and she's running marathons and, and she's on the Super Bowl and she's, you, you were presented with an award or something. I saw you yeah. were at some kind of gala. Yeah. So, so uh, you do really do set a really good example for a lot of kids and, and it's something that you uh, should be extremely proud of and that your parents should be extremely proud of and are extremely proud of and all of your friends and your entire structure of support that you have around you have all kind of contributed uh, to create this amazing sparkling little powerhouse of positive energy um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right so I want to talk about bravery beats yes <laughs> i want to talk about bravery beats because bravery beats to me um that's like one of my number one mandates um as special ops of evie's care is um making sure that every single occurrence is accounted for and, and beads collected and and we hang them very proudly on uh right next to his bed um, what are your favorite or most meaningful beads? Yeah, so I have them here. I'm hoping they don't make a lot of noise. <clears throat> They're my beads. <laughs> um, so, story about beads. Um, they didn't come to my unit. So when the Bravery Bead Program started, it started in the cancer patient ward. And I kind of fought for them to get to my unit because I didn't think it was fair. Obviously, patients who have cancer, like they go through some really, really tough times. Mm -hmm. But the Bravery Beads, in my opinion, was something that every kid deserved to get as a reward, um, not a reward, sorry, a symbolism of strength and what they had been through. So they didn't come to my unit until I was about 12. And I felt like I deserved beads to represent what I had been through 
before I was 12 because right. that's when most of my condition happened. So I went to the store and I bought, I don't know if you can see them, but this yep. one, for example, says number eight. And so on this one from here to this next big one was what I had been through, what I thought I, the bees I deserved. Uh, um, nice. So in each year up until they had them for my, my unit, I got, SickKids was willing to give me all my surgery beads. So I have all my surgery beads and then I got one bead to represent all the tests and scans I had been through that year and one bead for all the um, like procedures and things like that. Um, so I went to the store and I bought like big beads to represent the symbolism of each year. And then sick kids gave me my surgery beads, which I put in and then one bead to represent all the, the, the tests and procedures and stuff. Um, so my bravery beads are a bit of a, a jamble here, a jumble jamble. Um, but I got a lot of the ones with my name on it. Right. Um, but somewhere on here, I have Believe spelled out, which, I, as I mentioned before, was my word. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can see it there or if it'll be backwards. Move it a little this way. A little to the right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. Look at that. Um, so that one had really been, um, Believe has always been my word and what word I use to motivate myself to get through hard times. And that was always something I would look back on and be like, just believe, like, you can do it. But for me, Bravery Beats were just like a symbolism of everything I had been through and the strengths, the strength I had to overcome certain challenges. Um, this one here was the one that they give you when you like start your Bravery Beat collection. And that was the one that they had that big one in the Eaton Center that I think I sent you a photo of because yeah, it was so yeah. cool. Um, but yeah, so I have... Don't remember what the yellow ones were, but they clearly had a lot of the same thing over and over again. Um, but I look at them and I kind of makes me realize how much um, I've actually been through. Um, I only have one bead up until I was 12 for each year of all the tests and blood work and things that I had that year. But I can only imagine how how big my bravery beads would be if I if I had started collecting them from when I was born. Um, and yeah, it's just, I think it's a really big, it's really meaningful to me, but it's like a symbolism of strength and the challenges we overcome. Um, and like I said earlier, I think it's amazing that you have your tattoo, your son's tattooed on you because that's so, so, so special and, and sweet. I think it's so cute. <laughs> well, the, when, when Evie was, so before I had the tattoo, I actually, um, I actually had a replica of his first three days and I would wear it. I would wear it around my neck, like physically wear yeah. it. Um, but with all of the running and sweating and showering, they were starting yeah. to fade. So yeah. I was like, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to like, I don't want these to fade because I want to keep them. So yeah. I am just going to tattoo them on me. That way yeah. they're just there forever. So okay. this is a, this is a, uh, this represents, it goes all the way from here, yeah. like the top of my sternum, all the way around my neck. It is, uh, it is whatever it went through. All of these little things are whatever it went through those yeah. first three days of life. And that's crazy. That, that's just three days, right? Crazy. And this, this is his heartbeat, uh, the day we were discharged from the hospital for the oh, very first so time, I guess, first so time as a free soul out of the hospital. That's, that's the morning of discharge right there. That's so good. I love that. That's so cute. I hang mine beside my, all my race medals in my room. I have oh, all my, that's all my good. running oh, medals. That's hung good. Up. Yeah. That's so I have good. mine hanging <laughs> Oh yeah, Evie. Evie uh, was given like this little wooden uh, bowl that there's a there's a there's a team of volunteers that do woodworking, um, and uh, they don't they make these little urns looking things like these beautiful wood bowls um, with the, with lids on them, and they and they give them and they give them to the hospital to give to kids to store their bravery beads that's so cool yeah i just yeah, have mine like, hung up beside my medals because i think well it's, that's that's the perfect that's the perfect yeah, place for them that's i think the that perfect. my 
my brave blue beads are similar to my medals of that it's something that I've accomplished and I've overcome as I look at my brave blue beads and it's because of what I went to at the hospital that, like I said that I'm able to do what I'm doing now so it's crazy <laughs> That's, that's, that's amazing. I like the, I like the, the cars and I like the car, like the transfer beads and the discharge beads, um, because they represent progress and they represent, which is, which is something that when you're in the CCCU or when you're in 4D or in your, in the long-term ward, when you're living that hospital life, and, and, you know, sometimes you get stuck in the mud and there's not a lot of progress forward and you're taking one step forward, two steps back. Those days when you can move from the CCCU to the long term or when you can, you know, anywhere like those breakthrough beads, those. Yeah. And this just it represents hope and it represents kind of what everyone who's going through that is 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 hoping for and praying for every day that that you get that break or you get that you know you get that shift you get that advancement you know yeah for sure um final question okay. the name of the show is gratitude city so it's only fitting to ask what you or who you are most grateful for that is a very tough question. Um, first of all, I am so grateful for my family who has supported me these past 24 years in every challenge I have been faced with. Um, I'm so thankful and grateful for the staff at Sick Kids. My team that I had there was incredible. Not only did they care for me, but my family. Um, but I'm also grateful for the research and development and technology because that has been what has allowed sick kids to perform these procedures that I've undergone, to do these surgeries that have improved my quality of life. Um, because without that research, I probably wouldn't be here today because they wouldn't know what to do with me. They wouldn't know how to fix these problems. Right. Um, but yeah, overall, just... I'm grateful to be alive and to be here and to be able to share my story to, to make a difference and to impact others. Um, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to share my story today with you. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm grateful for you for taking the time to be here and, and share your story. Um, you said earlier that you want to be an RN and you want to be a nurse at SickKids. Yes. I want to give you the opportunity right now to call your shot because when you, I say when, when you do successfully do that, I want to be able to pull this clip of what you're about to say and I want to be able to give it to you so that you can just be historically correct on this. So look right into your camera and okay. tell the world that you are going to be an RN and you're going to be a nurse at SickKids. I am going to be an RN and become a nurse at SickKids. So she has said it before, but February 10th, 2021 on Gratitude City, Caitlin O'Brien, Babe Ruth calling her shot. There it is right there. I'm going yeah. to have that so that I can pull that for you. The day you start working at Sick Kids, you can pu pull this up and you can have your Babe Ruth moment. Yes. Maybe one day I'll be Evie's nurse. Imagine that. <laughs> can you <laughs> just so imagine? <laughs> crazy. Okay. Well, that's it. That's a wrap, folks. Episode three is in the books. Thank you very much to Caitlin O'Brien for coming in to chat with me today. And thank you very much to all of you who tuned into Jam with us. I hope you guys enjoy this episode and that you guys can take away with it uh, a little nugget that brought you value in some way, shape or form. Have an amazing day.